Good afternoon to our esteemed speakers, guests, participants, and organizers, and welcome to the virtual town hall discussion entitled Philippine Governance, Lessons and Prospects for the Marcos Jr. Administration. My name is Attorney Mildred Oble, Senior Program Officer of the Youth Leadership for Democracy of the Asia Foundation and USAID, and I will be your host and moderator for today. The six years of the Rodrigo Duterte administration was a time marked by strong manhood, local and international criticisms, major infrastructure projects, and a seeming pivot to China despite having an independent foreign policy. And under his leadership and during the health crisis, the country experienced democratic backsliding and record highs and record lows in terms of poverty, hunger, and joblessness. And in allegedly combating the COVID-19 pandemic, the country is now burdened by a gargantuan foreign debt of 12.5 trillion pesos. The current administration and Filipino citizens alike can learn much from the Duterte government. Learning from our history and looking back is necessary to build better and move forward. The Strat-based ADR Institute and Democracy Watch Philippines conducts a virtual forum this afternoon to discuss the Philippine governance lessons and prospects for the Marcos Jr. administration in order to unpack key lessons by looking back at President Duterte's term, as well as highlight key areas that President Marcos Jr. should address. And this virtual forum also tackles the concept of holistic governance in the Philippines and how this is all the more needed today. And through this virtual forum, we fervently hope that the key players from government, civil society, the private sector, and academia will better understand how to proceed under the current administration. Thus, we encourage our participants to utilize the webinar tools such as the Q&A to post your questions for our panelists so they may answer it live or directly in the same Q&A platform. And to formally start the discussion, I have the pleasure and honor of introducing our first speaker, who will share on the key issues and concerns of the Filipino people. Professor Victor Andres Dindo Manhit, or Professor Dindo Manhit, is the president of Stratface ADR Institute and the lead convener of Democracy Watch Philippines. And Professor Manhit has provided top-level strategic analysis and thought leadership on global issues in the Philippines since he founded Stratface in 2004. And as a public policy analyst and strategist, he thinks beyond politics for his political risk assessments and draws on a combination of backward-looking, fact-based, data-driven analytics with forward-looking thinking and strategic policy options. Ladies and gentlemen, may I call on Professor Victor Andres Dindo Madrid. Prof. Dindo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tony Dredd. Thank you to all our speakers for joining us here in our Institute's uh, virtual town hall discussion and for all the participants who will be here to listen to us. Allow me to share a presentation uh, that I prepared for this afternoon. I felt that if we will discuss democracy, governance challenges, it's best to look at it from some data that we continue to track in the Institute. Part of our concern has always been what are the geostrategic, political, and economic risks facing the Filipino nation. We continue to see the challenge of inequality more so with the pandemic's impact on income, jobs, and opportunities. We are still in what I call a, pub, a continuing public health crisis that has its own socio-economic consequences. It brought about a greater digital divide among our people. And from an economic point of view, this long emergency since the early part of 2020 continues to be a challenge to a to an economy driven by consumption. Maybe it's time to think, how can we turn our consumption-driven economy 
into one that is investment-led, that will create jobs? Or how do we play a role in the future of globalization and trade to sustain growth through export orientation? It can provide jobs for our people. Of course, any discussion of development today needs to be viewed from the green economic recovery program as we deal with global weirding, as I call it, or climate emergency. But beyond our borders, we continue to be challenged asymmetrically from traditional, non-traditional to evolving security challenges, cuts across areas of the Philippine economy and politics also. But at the core of all this, we can address, we can overcome this risk if governance evolves into one that is responsive in nature, one that is the one that is transparent and accountable, and one that truly serves the interest of the Filipino nation and the people. A few weeks back, I wrote in my regular commentary in the Philippine Daily Inquirer the need to activate elements of good governance. And one that is open and bold, government that is open and bold to initiate reforms that will make our governance system responsive, that will provide us a clear roadmap for sustainable growth under a regime of good governance. I share this as a thought because for me, that's the right direction to accelerate inclusive prosperity for the Filipino people. Why do I say this a few days ago, a few weeks back? Because when I saw data that we tracked at the eve of the inauguration of the Marcos Jr. administration, you see on top what they inherited, what the Duterte legacy is really an economically challenged Filipino nation. Yeah. One dealing with high cost of living, the desire for better pay for workers, the need for more jobs, the reduction of poverty, and even hunger. So this is what I call the economic consequences of the 30 administration or the economic consequences of the pandemic. But at the core of it is how do we fight graft and corruption in government with all the resources from our own taxes, from debts incurred by government. And this urgent national concern is something that we see across geographic area across demographic area. And when you look at a more personal question, what about the personal concerns of our people? What do we see, especially when we see this, again, representing top demographics, geographic divisions in our country? You see how important basic needs are. Staying healthy and avoiding illness. Having a secure and well-paying job or source of income. Able enough to have enough to eat every day. These are what you call basic needs. And we continue to be challenged by that. And this is where the previous government, the administration of Duterte, did not do well. From the perception of the public themselves. You see them doing very well in fighting criminality from the perception of people, controlling the spread of COVID. But when you look at economic challenges, gut issues of survival, and even in corruption, though, they rose in the last quarter by 10%. Maybe this is due to the strong advocacy, the strong propaganda on the Duterte legacy. But still, that's not a good rating ending your administration, considering how you have projected yourself six years on. But more than that, as I look forward, this is what the Duterte legacy is. This is what 
the new government of Marcos Jr. has inherited. And this is comparable to what we saw in some other source for data. The worst is over, or COVID is beyond us. But what is not over is poverty. It has risen through the years, and it remains to be a challenge to Filipinos. Not only under social weather stations, self-rated poverty, even the poverty self-rating by Pulse Asia. And with poverty, I always see hunger. We have improved or recovered from the height of the pandemic. Still, people remain hungry. And hunger emanates from lack of livelihood opportunities for our people. For a country with so much potential resources, both government and natural resources, how come? We have recovered. If we listen to government, but still we see some red numbers with regards to agriculture sector. Industry has not reached where it was pre-pandemic. Services has recovered, but the pandemic tells us how services can be at the core of sustained growth in our country. At the core is jobs or industries or sectors that can create jobs. When I see jobless Filipinos, it doesn't end there. I see also underemployed Filipinos, but because for them, they might have the job, but the income is not enough. I would like to see those underemployment numbers in a single digit, but that means we need to create those job opportunities. In one of our occasional paper, we have asked the president of the Philippine Economic Society, Dr. Justin Jock Nusikat, to write a paper about inclusive growth. And I wanted to share one of her arguments. He builds on the advocacy of the government on fiscal consolidation and resource mobilization programs. That means you need to be aggressive still in spending. But what I took note of is this positive view that the Philippine economy, if managed well, and when I say managed well, I refer to governance, can outgrow the pandemic-induced debt. That is the legacy of the Duterte government. And to provide substantial buffers to respond to lingering and future economic shock. At the core of all this, is the title itself of the paper, Inclusive Growth with Innovative Public Sector Governance. And in one of our analysis, August 2022, just this month, we wrote about the need for a more investment-driven strategy for long-term growth and development. We speak of a point of view that no single player possess all the necessary resources for national development. Key is government working with the private sector that can create jobs, working with broader stakeholders, workers, consumers, customers, that maybe from there we can improve the lives of our people. So we speak of the need to strategize for long-term economic growth. And what is our basis for saying this? We actually did a study last year, October of last year, and we're running it again this, this September. When we asked, what are the actions that the next administration could focus on to improve the Philippine economy? Geographic areas basically tells us jobs is at the core of it. Corruption is number three. Controlling prices of basic services and commodities is number two. We ask this across different age groups, similar results. It basically tells us at the core of our sustained development 
sustained economic growth is job creation. But job creation cannot be limited to Filipinos themselves. We need to open ourselves to foreign investors. But both domestic and foreign investors will always demand better governance from government. Fast forward to end of June, it's still the same with different numbers. How do we control increases in prices? That's understandable, given what is happening globally, not only internally in the country. How do we create employment? How do we craft new poor, 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 poor programs in government? I say this because admi administration is an opportunity. On the first day of this year, I wrote a commentary which I entitled, Let's Not Squander Another Six Years. And I was writing it to whoever that candidate is that will win. In this case, it's the Marcos Jr. campaign that won. That the new administration will need a forward-looking governance outlook with a multifaceted approach towards effectively leading, managing, and empowering society without sacrificing any sector anchored on collaboration between government, private sector, and civil society. Competition is beyond our borders. National interest tells us we need to work together. On the day, the day after the election, my commentary in the business world, I spoke of the need to enable, for an enabling and stable environment. That should be laid down for private and non-government sectors. We have had six years of the Duterte administration that built its governance style. I always say it, I go back to what I've said in my classes in the past. You cannot build governance from an arrogance of power. And in this case, purely arrogance of power. Side by side with shaping people's minds through propaganda. But what we need to build the Filipino nation I mean, is a three-way trusting relationship between government, the private sector, and civil society. For us to recover, for us to sustain our development efforts. And I go back to an article I shared earlier, the importance of good governance to progress. Government power should be used to strengthen and build industries, create that environment, and not for politically motivated interests or agendas. This is an important lesson that I hope the Marcos Jr. administration will hopefully remedy by focusing on the headline goals of real GDP growth, single-digit poverty rate, managing our national government deficit, our national government debt to GDP ratio and gross national income. It cannot be addressed by government alone, but it can be addressed by a synergistic partnership with the private sector, both civil society, academe, and the business sector, and the participation of the whole of society. And that's what we hope for as we bring people together with thoughts on governance, democratic governance. That is a shared value that we have this afternoon. And let's build on that. Again, good morning. And thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts on public issues and concerns of the Filipino people. Thank you, Prof. Tindo Manhit. I'm sure with the data presented and your insights that you shared, our participants have a lot of questions already. I kindly use our Q&A tool in our Zoom webinar for your questions that can be addressed later on during the open forum. I will now introduce our next speaker to share on the topic, the Philippines under Duterte, a term and performance evaluation based on international governance indicators. Mr. Edwin P. Santiago, is currently an associate professor at De La Salle University, where he handles courses in both the Political Science and Development Studies programs of the Political Science Department. 
He has extensive experience in public service, having been connected with several government agencies, such as the Department of Budget and Management, the Philippine Gaming and Amusement Corporation, and the Department of Finance. His primary fields of expertise are leadership, management, administration, process improvement, and organizational development. He is also a non-resident fellow at the Stratface ADR Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, may call on Mr. Edwin P. Santiago. Sir Edwin, the floor is yours. You may unmute yourself. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, let me just uh, work on my screen. Okay, can can everybody see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you, Professor Dean Dumanheep and uh, Democracy Watch for this opportunity. I will be presenting my paper, The Philippines Under Duterte, a Term and Performance Evaluation Based on International Governance Indicators. Renowned management guru Peter Drucker said that if you can't measure it, you can improve it. As a management practitioner, a teacher, and a customer, one of my routine tasks is to deter is to do performance evaluation. That is to measure or make a determination of how well or not a certain individual, a team, or organization accomplishes tasks or goals as contained in what are known as KPIs or key performance indicators. Many things are riding on the results of the evaluation. Okay, so thus whenever and for whoever we do these evaluations, we ideally want to be as objective as possible. But unless we only use those which defy interpretation, such as being punctual, you're either on time or not, or quotas, you either met your quota or not, performance evaluations are generally subjective in nature that is based on judgment. To reduce issues associated with subjective evaluations, we communicate our expectations to those who will be at the receiving end of the evaluation. We also use rubrics. Uh, to make ratings more consistent. You all also heard of models such as Kaplan and Norton's balance scorecard, et cetera. Given all this talk about measuring performance, does it not raise the question why we do not grade our government and our leaders in some unified way that is known to the public? For instance, how do we settle who is the best president among those in the slide. Okay. Of course, many people will argue that the decision of the voters during elections is the ultimate performance evaluation. That may be true to some extent under theoretical conditions, but those who have reached term limits cannot get re-elected no matter how well they perform. Government agencies do not get elected. Uh, the cabinet members do not get elected. The president does not get re-elected. The entire administration does not get elected. Take the Duterte administration. Starting with this last State of the Nation address in July 2021, Duterte has not wasted any opportunity reciting his achievements. Expectedly, opposition politicians lambasted and negated these claims, calling this a super spreader event of lies, threats, empty and failed promises, inaccuracies and misleading information, all of which were already fact-checked and disproven before. A two-day Duterte Legacy Summit was even held to showcase the accomplishments of the six-year administration of President Duterte in what was dubbed the final report to the people. Among the accomplishments the administration lays claim to are the fulfillment of campaign promises such as the universal healthcare law and Malasakit Center, universal access to quality 
tertiary education, Bangsamoro organic law, modern infrastructure under the Build, Build, Build program, and the anti-illegal drugs campaign, and so on. Not surprisingly, the Duterte Legacy Summit was marked with controversies. Finance Secretary Carlos Dominguez reported that many socio-economic reform measures were finally enacted under the Duterte administration, including the rice tarification law. Ironically, this law was denounced as an assault on farmers' productivity and welfare. Critics said that if there were any legacy that Duterte would leave to farmers, it would be neglect. For the Commission on Human Rights, the administration's legacy is one where the government encouraged a culture of impunity. According to its 48-page report, this finding is based on an earlier determination by the CHRN Bank that police used excess unreasonable force and showed clear intent to kill during anti-drug operations. This scenario of contradicting assessments pervades the political scene, not just in the Philippines. But both sides cannot be right on the same issue. For some political observers, the classic job approval rating measures a president's performance. In the Philippines, this takes the form of the satisfaction ratings released by the social weather stations and the performance approval ratings and trust ratings by Pulse Asia Research. On the other hand, there is a widespread consensus that the state of the economy matters for presidents standing in public. This is because the performance of an economy is usually assessed in terms of the achievement of economic objectives such as growth and development. This presentation will use the indicators of good governance listed by the National Economic Development Authority. It will be interesting to see how the Duterte administration fared using the very measures the administration selected. These are the worldwide governance indicators, ease of doing business, global competitiveness index, economic freedom index, corruption perception index, rule of law index, and open budget index. If you notice the slide, I also put in red box the URL uh, to signify this is coming from the website of NEDA. Now, these indices compare and rank countries in various performance and policy areas. These measures are not without criticisms with methodological, conceptual, and logical flaws commonly cited. Nonetheless, these indices may arguably present, albeit obliquely, a view of the president's performance in a similar way that a company's performance reflects that of its chief executive officer. Let's start with the worldwide governance indicators. The WGI measures the quality of governance in over 200 countries using key, six key dimensions of governance. Voice and accountability, political stability and absence of violence, terrorism, third governance effectiveness, regulatory quality, rule of law, and finally control of corruption. Okay, uh, while the paper presents the, uh, the detailed data supporting the, uh, the rankings and the score, uh, for this presentation, I opted just to present the summary uh, results okay, in the interest of time. So you can see that for the uh, six indicators under WGI, uh, the administration, that the that administration fared well in political stability and absence of violence and government effectiveness. That also means that it did not fare very well in the other four. When I say Duterte administration, I am comparing uh, the ranking and the score at the time Duterte assumed power in 2016 and the latest uh, result of the index that I'm presenting 
which could be 2022, 2020, or 2021. Okay, so I will summarize this all of these indices further uh, towards the end. For ease of doing business, the ease of doing business index is part of the annual doing business report published by the World Bank Group. Higher rankings indi indicated better and simpler regulations for business. The ranking was based on the sub indices starting a business, dealing with construction permits, getting electricity, registering property, getting credit, protecting investors, paying taxes, trading across borders, enforcing contracts, and finally, resolving insolvency. Okay, from the ranking, each country is classified as very easy, easy, medium, or below average in terms of ease of doing business. Okay, so again, the summary results. Okay, so you can see that of the 10 uh, indicators under or sub indices under ease of doing business, uh, the Duterte administration fared well in three out of 10, but failed or the situation in the Philippines uh, deteriorated in the other seven. But overall, the ranking uh, or the uh, classification of uh, the Philippines remains the same as EC. Okay. Now, the, the Global Competitiveness Index is a ranking integrated into the Global Competitiveness Report published annually by the World Economic Forum, the GCI assesses the competitiveness landscape of countries and how countries achieve and maintain economic growth. The World Economic Forum defines competitiveness as the set of institutions, policies, and factors that determine the level of productivity of a country. The fundamental principle of WEF is that a more competitive economy is more likely to grow faster over time. Okay. The ranking of the Philippines under the leadership of Duterte in the Global Competitiveness Index dropped significantly in 2019 uh, to 64th place from the previous year's 56th place and the 57th place when he assumed the presidency in 2016, a drop of eight and seven spots respectively. Okay. Now for the breakdown, the GCI is divided into actually 12 pillars grouped into four components as follows, enabling environment, human capital, markets, and innovation ecosystem. Under each, you have the 12 pillars. Okay, so for Enabling environment, you have institutions, infrastructure, ICT or information communications technology adoption and macroeconomic stability. Uh, the Duterte administration, I mean the Philippines under the Duterte administration uh, worsened during, well, during that administration. For the second, you have, for the second component, human capital, you have health which went down, skills went up, product market, labor market, financial system, and market size all went up. Business dynamism, innovation capability, I mean, business dynamism went up, innovation capability went down. Next is the index of economic freedom. The index of economic freedom is released annually by the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal. Heritage Foundation defines economic freedom 
as the fundamental right of every human to control his or her own labor and property. The organization explained further that in an economically free society, individuals are free to work, produce, consume, and invest in any way they please, and that the Gover that governments allow labor, capital, and goods to move freely and refrain from coercion or constraint of liberty beyond the extent necessary to protect and maintain liberty itself. Okay. If you look at the chart, overall, while the Philippines suffered loss of rank spots, uh, it has not from, from numbers from number 60, rank 60 in 2016 to rank 80 in 2022, uh, it does not change its classification as mostly free. Okay. Countries are scored on 12 aspects divided into four categories, rule of law, government size, regulatory efficiency, and market openness. Okay, under rule of law, you have property rights, which went up, judicial effectiveness went down, government integrity went down. As to government size, tax burden, government spending, fiscal health, they all went down. As to regulatory efficiency, our, our rank in business freedom, and monetary freedom went down, labor freedom went up. As to market openness, trade freedom went down, investment freedom and financial freedom remained the same. Okay. Next is the Cor Corruption Perceptions Index. Okay. Every year, the non-governmental organization, Transparency International, publishes the Corruption Perceptions Index, which ranks countries based on the perceived level of corruption, which is abuse of entrusted power for private gain in the public sector. Okay. According to Transparency International, the global average in 2021 is 33 points, and that two-thirds of countries scored below 50, indicating serious corruption problems. The Philippines belongs with those countries scoring below 50 and with serious corruption problems. Worse, it also scored way lower than the global average. Under the Duterte administration, the Philippines started off with a CPI rank of 101 in 2016. By 2021, it registered a rank of 117. If we're talking about rank, the lower the number, the better. Okay? So this means that the Philippines dropped 16 spots in the ranking in terms of corruption perception. Next is the rule of law index. The rule of law index is based on eight dimensions of the rule of law, constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, order and security, fundamental rights, open government, regulatory enforcement, civil justice, and criminal justice. It is released annually by the World Justice Project, an international civil or society organization committed to working to advance the rule of law around the world. The rule of law is defined by the World Justice Project as a durable system of laws, institutions, norms, and community commitment that delivers accountability, just law, open government, and accessible and impartial justice. According to the organization, rule of law correlates to higher economic growth. So the higher the rule of law, the higher the economic growth, greater peace, less inequality, improved health outcomes, and more education. So looking at the results, the Philippines worsened 
in terms of the indicators of rule of law under the Duterte administration. And finally, uh, we have the Open Budget Index. The Open Budget Survey was launched in 2016 by the International Budget Partnership, uh, which describes the OBS as the world's only comparative, independent, and regular assessment of transparency, oversight, and participation in national budgets in 120 countries. The OBI measures the overall commitment to transparency and whether governments are releasing eight key budget documents. In 2017, the first year the Duterte administration intersected with the release of the OBI, the country ranked 19 and scored 67 points. By the next release in 2019, the Philippines made it to the top 10 countries, ranking 10 with a score of 76. However, the Duterte administration would end its term in 2022 with the most recent OBI release in 2021 with the same ranking at 19th spot as in 2017, but with an increase in score by one point, if that's any consolation. In summary for the worldwide governance indicators, okay, so this is the summary. Philippine standing improved in two out of six areas. Uh, yeah, political stability and absence of violence and in government if effectiveness. In general, there was also an improvement in terms of doing business. However, looking at the specific areas, the country managed to improve only in three out of 10 which are dealing with construction permits, protecting minority investors, and paying taxes. For the Global Competitiveness Index, overall the country's position worsened uh, under the Duterte administration using the index of economic freedom. Overall, the Philippines worsened under the rule of law index over all the country worsened under the Duterte administration. The corruption perceptions index registered a worsening situation uh, for the Philippines. The rule of law index also the same. The open budget index essentially showed no change under the Duterte administration. These indicators are in the realm of the abstract for the average Filipino. For them, the accomplishments that are being trumpeted by the administration may be the ones that are tangible and relatable to the people. Of course, any claim of achievement or, or failing will always be met with controversies arising from differences in interpretations, approach and political affiliation. The results of the governance indicators used do not paint a rosy picture for the quality of governance under the Duterte administration in so far as the very areas covered by their own NEDA is concerned. While this is not to say that the administration failed miserably, it does not project a high quality governance either. In the final analysis, what is important is that the performance evaluation of any administration should be done objectively and that it comes with a forward-looking perspective of benefiting from the experiences of the administration that was. In the words of Dr. Tuft, uh, Professor Emeritus at Yale University, there are two goals when presenting data, convey your story and establish credibility. Nonetheless, the indicators remain valuable as they provide an independent and objective view into the general quality or health, if you will, of the governance in the country on specific periods in our history. Because of this, the indicators may also present, albeit indirectly, a report card of the performance in specific areas of governance of the presidencies covered. Beyond that, the rankings and scores supply a comparative perspective relative to the countries in the region and the rest of the world. 
in some of the indicators, the drop in the ranking of the Philippines may mean a faster rate of improvement by other countries rather than a backsliding of the Philippine government's vigilance and efforts. It may be argued that good governance will always be a moving target, not only because of its form and shape are constantly evolving, but also given the changes in the political environment. Notwithstanding, it has become one of the cor cornerstones by which public leadership is reckoned. How well an administration performs in achieving good governance may have far-reaching implications on its political capital. Now, the new Marcos administration is heavily saddled with the old Marcos brand that is widely seen as antithetical to good governance. If the new administration is to have any chance at succeeding in casting off the effects of that negative reputation, it would have to make bigger strides than other administrations towards good governance. It is not as if he must start from scratch. The indicators provide baseline data that could serve as inputs for new good governance programs and for decisions about existing programs that will stay, go, or be revised. What could be difficult, though, is the political will to see the programs through amid conflicting political pressures. Thank you, and good afternoon. Thank you, Sir Santiago, for that uh, very comprehensive sharing. I know it's not an easy task to report on a term and uh, performance evaluation of the Duterte administration. And uh, we'll now proceed to our next speaker. Um, I'm sure the questions can be answered later on during the Q&A. Um, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Rizal G. Buendia. And Dr. Buendia is the Philippine country expert of the global BDEM Institute at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. He is the former chair of the Political Science Department and associate professor at the De La Salle University, Manila. His fields of specialization are in social development, ethnopolitics, Southeast Asian politics, comparative politics, international relations, and public administration and governance. And he's also an unrested fellow at the Stratface ADR Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, to discuss on the topic holistic governance, may I call on Dr. Rizal G. Buendia. Dr. Buendia, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Can... Yes. yes, sir, you are clear. Okay, the... I'll just uh, have to share my slide. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. The screen is Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. I foremost to uh, Professor Dindo Manhit, uh, the president and CEO of the Stratbase uh, Institute. And also to my um, colleagues, uh, Professor Edwin Santiago and uh, Dr. Uh, Francisco Magno. Uh, greetings uh, for uh, for seeing you online, at least. Uh, now, uh, my presentation is uh, uh, was the uh, address May 2022 occasional paper. I'm I'm, I'm happy to share my uh, my uh, my concept on on this aspect. Now, for the interests of uh, time limitation, I'll be uh, focusing on uh, three major areas. Uh, and these are the concept of uh, holistic uh, governance, uh, the proposed strategies and issues and uh, challenges of uh, holistic governance uh, uh, in case it will have to be uh, institutionalized uh, in the Philippines. Um, generally, holistic governance incorporates uh, internal structures of government rules, 
standards and norms of behavior of civil servants. Holistic and effective government will require that government move steady, steadily toward a sharper focus on real outcomes, such as better health, lower unemployment, or less crime, rather than the measures of activity which have dominated most uh, recent phase of reform. Holistic governance uh, provides opportunities for citizen engagement and enhances role of enterprises, especially for the internet enterprises in the digital context. Holistic governance is actually not new. The British scholar Albert Asworth, who changed his name to Paris Six in 1983, was first who advocated the concept of holistic uh, government in 1997 in this book, Holistic Government. Departmentalism um, is the key problem that holistic governance wants to address. Coordination and integration of related departments seems to be the answer. Then referred to as join up government or JUG under the administration of former British Prime Minister Tony Blair in 1999 was intended to deal with the problem of departmentalism existing within the rigid structures of public institutions which hinder the effective utilization of resources and taking on initiatives. Otherwise known as horizontal management in Canada, connecting government in Australia and whole of government in New Zealand, JUG was not a uniquely British phenomenon as other countries face similar problems on departmentalism. That includes the Philippines. Paris 6 contends that the silos perspective of different departments hampers the problem solving capability of government. Perry together with his associates expanded the concept of holistic government to holistic governance in his book towards holistic governance, the new reform agenda in 2002. A paradigmatic switch emerges with the change of approach from quote unquote public affairs to quote unquote the public, referring to citizens, taxpayers, and clients. The table shows the three major paradigms of public administration with their similarities and differences. Now, focusing on holistic governance, it covers vertical and horizontal modes of public affairs governance that involves an increased participation of private sector to co-produce and co-distribute public services. With the phenomenon of globalization and internet revolution, otherwise known as the fourth industrial revolution, the meaning of governance encompasses levels of subnational, national, and cross-national governments, as well as the variety of public bodies and public-private partnerships. The advancement of information technology makes e-government an inevitable governing option. Along these lines, governance uses coordination, integration, and responsibility as mechanisms, utilizes information technology to integrate different levels of governance, functions of governance, public-private cooperation, and information system organically, increasingly facilitates the process from parts to the whole and from fragmentation to integration. Compared to JUG, holistic governance covers more ground and poses a daunting challenge to the current level of governance. Now, uh, proposed strategies are three, online uh, governance, uh, integrated organization, and active civil service. Now, briefly, uh, online governance is set to achieve efficiency, quality, and democracy through a, a digital technology that is able to foster governmental operations for an enhanced delivery of integrated public services, as well as rules and standards. In holistic governance, people can obtain a whole range of public services from a single entry portal 
This requires integration among different levels of governments, integration among different departments and integration among websites. Online governance will be the major driver for holistic governance. Secondly, promoting an integrated government organization calls for two dimensions. One, horizontal departmental integration and integration with the matrix type of organizational framework and to the cross-cutting departments that serve the purpose of coordinating cross boundaries issues. The integration of government functions needs not only the integrating mechanisms, but also a changing of value structure in government operation. These values include integrity, accountability, service, equity, innovation, teamwork, excellence, honesty, commitment, quality, openness, communication, recognition, trust, effectiveness, and leadership. These organizational values are dynamic, interactive, forward-looking, and active in nature. Cultivating these values and making them the backbone of governmental operation demands a different uh, breed of civil servant. Holistic governance becomes a reality when an active civil service exists, as articulated by Robert Denhard and Janet Denhard in their new public service published in 2003. The public sector has to possess the following qualities, commitment toward organizational values, dedication to serve the public, staunchness to empowerment and leadership sharing and allegiance to pragmatic incrementalism. That is, incrementalism is a realistic and practical way to pursue needed reforms gradually through a, a pluralistic process of trial and error. An active civil service, therefore, needs a new system of human resources management that recruits and selects civil servants possessing qualities like moral sense, firm commitment, and great initiative. Administrators should have strong democratic and ethical convictions, deep belief, the superior qualities of democracy, the moral vision of democracy. And so it is evident that political leadership will play the most important role in achieving the momentum that the holistic governance ideal demands. Philippine bureaucracy remains beset with a long list of complex administrative dysfunctions from graft and corruption, red tape incompetence, inefficiency, and centralization of political patronage and spoils system to bureaucratic size. The dysfunctionality of Philippine system of government is much related to politics. This is part of the paper succinctly deliberates on. Um, some issues and challenges that need to be addressed. These are, I, I identified here five uh, outcome-based departments, integration of budget information systems, civil service value system, and anticipatory governance. In as much as there are only 13 core functional departments, these are home or interior affairs, foreign affairs, finance, economic affairs, defense, education, justice, transportation, labor, agriculture, culture, environment, and social security. The country has 24 departments. It is therefore suggested to shift from governing by functions to outcome-based departments. For example, in a poverty alleviation program, power and responsibility of the Department of Labor and Employment may be increased while other departments' power related to the former is reduced or recalib recalibrated to operate the whole range of functions in support of housing, policy on family, public health, public information, cultural policy, crime, and so on. In line with holistic governance, Public management is built largely around the notion of performance and improving the efficiency and effectiveness of public institutions. 
Similarly, budgets need to be organized not by functions, but around outcomes and geographical areas, right down to the level of the LGUs to enable the services can be designed in the most effective way, closely focusing on key social groups in each area, especially targeting vulnerable groups like the elderly, children, women, minorities, and persons with disabilities, either physically or psychologically challenged or both. Holistic budgeting uh, by geographical area will decentralize much of bringing together important information and intelligence to give much greater financial scope to local purchasing agencies to design and strategize services as they, are, they see suitable for local development. <coughs> In this situation, it will be possible to establish more downward accountability and transparency to citizens and service users. On the part of the national government, the central system of, of oversight, audit, and policy re review will then be its fundamental concern that is concentrating on monitoring and evaluation, identifying lessons on effectiveness and value for money and disseminating best practice from local innovation. On information systems, it becomes imperative to integrate the front end of government on the parts or the parts of government that deal with citizens. This could be done online by using computer system that would bring to citizens' attention all the services available and those that they might help them. One-stop shops or offices that offer multiple public services or goods that become the foremost means by which public deals with government, both physically and electronically through a common interface. This does not uh, simplify the process of dealing with government as well as for government's customers, but also provide convenience and efficiency to citizens. To make systems more comprehensible and extensive, one-stop shops are to be organized around life events which trigger people's need for services like certificates of birth, marriage, or death, funeral service, becoming unemployed, losing a home, legal adoption, annulment of marriage, or life or and non-life insurance etc. Under holistic governance, an improved breed of civil servants is developed. They are subjected to rigid performance, audit, inspection, and scrutiny. These professionals are trained not only in identifying which target to meet, but also how to go about meeting them through detailed prescription of professional practice. That is how public services are are delivered using allocated resources. Note that the failure of the bureaucracy to carry out its tasks and respond to urgent challenges erode the political legitimacy of government. Finally, on anticipatory governance, uh, it is a subset of holistic governance which envisions governance on the long term. In the case of the Philippines, it is considered that its political system reinforces not long but chronic short term missing. Government's policy direction, plans, and programs are aligned almost with the electoral cycle. <clears throat> Departments under the executive branch concentrate on rendering public services that are tremendously curative, fixated on intervening after the event. The reactive rather than proactive response of the Philippine government at the height of the COVID-19 outbreak in the, in the country manifests the short-sightedness of political leaders. In the course of the aforesighted, aforesighted uh, actionable proposals, it is crucial to decentralize some tasks such as overall goal setting, gauging and mesh and measuring outcomes and agreeing on budgets. Others will need to be decentralized, such as 
information and data gathering initiative and innovation program design and local project output delivery and local democratic accountability to users and public. To conclude, <clears throat> the next six years governance becomes a crucial issue. The opportunity to shift governance from extensive fragmentation and functional to integration has never before so great. Akin to other advocacies and movements, holistic governance needs political champions at every level, national, regional, and local government. Turning around the Philippine bureaucracy into the direction of public service that embrace cultures of holism, cultural change, and outcome orientation is indeed challenging. Throughout the civil service agencies, local government as well, as the public sector professions. Leaders are needed to carry forward the program of holistic governance. If bureaucratic transformation is to be realized, politicians, policymakers, and bureaucrats have to learn to participate actively in the process of integration, to give up some political and organizational interests, and to provide and mobilize more resources to appropriate departments, agencies, and offices. Only when these are fulfilled, reformers, campaigners, and champions talk seriously of a government that works. Now, remember, these are broad strokes, and the details are not uh, <clears throat> would be subject to another another paper. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Pantilla, for that very holistic sharing. And um, to give uh, his insights and reflections from the sharing of our esteemed speakers, um, we'll ask later on our esteemed speakers to stay for the question and answer and open forum. Um, now, uh, to proceed, let me introduce our uh, next speaker, Dr. Francisco Kiko Magno who is a trustee and convener of the Strat-based ADRI and senior fellow and the founding director of the De La Salle Institute of Governance. He is a full professor of political science and former chairperson of the political science department and former director of the Social Development Research Center in the De La Salle University, Manila. So to share his insights and reflections from the sharing of our esteemed speakers, Ladies and gentlemen, um, Dr. Francisco Magno. Dr. Magno, you have the floor. Thank you, Attorney Dre. Uh, it's a great pleasure listening to three excellent presentations that complement one another and offer a path towards good governance reform in the Philippines. Professor Dean Dumanhit provided us with the big, big picture, the importance of uh, governance in the economic development of a country, while Professor Edwin Santiago provided us the importance of governance performance indicators and how data is very critical in understanding the governance situation in the countries and therefore offers us a path to move forward. While uh, Dr. Uh, Rolly Bundia gave us a framework for action and it's a it's a very it's a new framework and uh, i believe uh, governments especially our government our new government will benefit from framing uh, reform efforts in this new framework so let me uh, move quickly into the the key points shared by our speakers Professor Dean Dumanhit uh, emphasized that activating good governance will create an empowered national ecosystem that we need to motivate both local and foreign direct investments. So emphasis on good, good governance. So good governance is good for the economy. And uh, he highlighted that fighting graft and corruption is among the top five most urgent national concerns based on the June 20. 22 Pulse Asia survey. 
But he didn't stop at just citing the most urgent national concerns. He moved into the urgent personal concerns, which means that uh, these two are tied up together. It's not just the concern of people about what's happening in the country, but actually it is connected to their personal development. And the, the most urgent personal concerns are staying healthy, securing income, daily sustenance, education, and housing. But again, the satisfaction of these personal concerns would uh, rely a lot on having good governance. The past administration's whimsical and arbitrary pronouncements, as noted by Professor Manhit, created a culture of animosity between the government, private sector, and civil society. So he therefore argued for the need to rebuild trust and foster collaborative governance. So later we will see that uh, in the presentation of Dr. Bendia, his uh, framework is really anchored on holistic governance, uh, highly collaborative interactions among different uh, stakeholders, both government and non-government sectors. And finally, I would like to quote Professor Manhid, who said that government power should be used to build industries rather than to pursue narrow politically motivated agenda. So I think that is very consistent with what Professor Dindo has emphasized that we have to go beyond politics. And going beyond politics doesn't mean that we don't uh, carry politics in our sleeves, in our pockets. It's there. But politics is an instrument for achieving development, for achieving uh, achieving uh, sus uh, sustainability in our society. Now, let me move to what uh, Professor Edwin Santiago shared with us. And he assessed the Philippines under the Duterte administration based on international governance indicators. This is a very comprehensive presentation looking at a variety of uh, governance indicators, starting with the worldwide governance indicators actually used by our National Economic and Development Authority in the Philippine Development Plan. And uh, what's nice about the presentation of uh, Professor Santiago is that he used a thumbs up, uh, thumbs up and thumbs down uh, rating. I think that can also be, be useful in uh, civic education, civic, uh, even at the uh, a basic education level, because it's um, a way by which people actually make choices and, and choices that are based on indicators. So thumbs down, uh, according to Professor Edwin, uh, but of course using the indicators, thumbs down on voice and accountability, regulatory quality, rule of law and control of corruption. Thumbs up for political stability and absence of violence. And this can be attributed to the passage of the Bangsamoro Organic Law, creation of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority. Okay, uh, there is the ease of doing business and uh, thumbs up. Uh, given the disaggregated uh, indicators in dealing with construction, protecting minority investors and tax payments. Well, thumbs down on starting a business, getting electricity, registering property, access to credit, trading across borders, enforcing contracts, deciding on ins insolvency. So these are not just grand uh, grand opinions. No? Hindi lang opinion. Uh, nakabatay ito sa ano, no? mga actual processes and how uh, how these processes are rated uh, ba based on uh, based on uh, on uh, on metrics thumbs down on rule of law uh, based on the rule of law index uh, speaking of constraints on government powers absence of corruption order and security fundamental rights open government regulatory enforcement civil justice and criminal justice Mukhang marami-rami yun, no? yung sa rule of law. So maraming kailangang uh, asikasuhin ang bagong gobyerno para mapaganda ang ating rule of law. And rule of law is, is not just uh, an opinion. It's a reality. And uh, since it's a reality, it is important uh, in, uh, in fostering uh, good uh, operation and management and that will benefit the economy. 
overall, uh, given the the international indicators that Edwin used, thumbs down when it comes to in general the worldwide governance indicators, ease of doing business, global competitiveness index, index of economic freedom, corruption perceptions index, and the rule of law index, and thumbs up for open budget index. So mukang uh, yung yun ang ano bright side no yung open budget index which means that uh, our budget institutions are uh, on the path towards modernization in fact there is a proposed bill proposed law on uh, budget modernization now let me end my uh, comment on the presentation of professor Edwin Santiago when he said the challenge is clear the Philippines need to rise up in addressing the governance deficits left behind by the Duterte administration. And this, I, I, find, uh, I find very nice that he made this statement that the inspiration to engage in good governance reform by the new Marcos Jr. administration should emanate not from the old Marcos Sr. administration saddled with corruption problems, human rights issues, and economic price, crisis, but from the people themselves as uh, cited by Professor Manhid, Manhid uh, the urgent national concerns uh, by, where people cited the eradication of corruption as an urgent national concern. So uh, it would be good for the uh, new Marcos Jr. administration to veer away from the legacy of the Marcos Sr. administration uh, because of a legacy of corruption. No? So mukhang dapat eh, Pag-iba na yung narrative, no? Na it's towards good governance. Finally, Dr. Rizal Buendia presented to us uh, a model, no? a new framework of holistic governance. And I find the, the chart or the table he presented uh, comparing uh, the traditional bureaucracy, which is uh, the Weberian, the, the public administration model that we are familiar with, and towards the new public management that came out in the 80s up to the year 2000 and a current uh, governance model uh, which is termed holistic governance. In terms of the management concept, this holistic governance moves from public-private partnership of the past and central local partnership towards a new concept called joint up department. So it's not, it's not departments that are isolated, operating in silos, but departments to, that speak to one another. Uh, our government uses the term whole of government approach. Um, in a way, this kind of concept is still linked to the notion of new public management. But when we use the term whole of governance, then we move towards this new concept of holistic governance. And I'm actually waiting for the next lecture of uh, Professor Bendia because he said that he will write a new, a new paper that will flesh out uh, in more detail the holistic governance. Okay, I, I'll move fast now. The operational principle, or operational principle from functional to integrated operation consisting of governance, technology, and people. I think uh, we can relate it to what uh, uh, President uh, Marcos mentioned in his State of the, the Nation address, Sona, where he talked uh, at length the, the need for a digital nation, a digital Philippines. I think this holistic governance framework provided to us by Dr. Buendia is very appropriate. Uh, the organizational type would be from hierarchy, uh, hierarchy yan yung Weberian, no? Max Weber, towards a network type of governance. No? This, is, this is a very uh, modern concept, no? a network governance. Hindi pa masyadong ginagamit yan, pero that's the reality as we move towards the fourth industrial revolution, and as we take seriously our commitment to implement the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. SDGs, ano yan eh? Sustainable Development Agenda 2030. And in the Philippine context, it is linked to ambition natin 2040. Mga future-oriented yan, no? It's part of what 
uh, Dr. Bendy is talking about anticipatory governance. For this uh, movement to work, there has to be civil service reforms. I, I think uh, uh, there, there, is, uh, there are bills filed on civil service reform. So I think this is uh, something that was missing on the state of the nation address, but perhaps can be revisited. Emphasize the values of accountability, public service, and empowerment, responsibility, and integrity in the civil service. So the public service ideal is to offer public service based on meeting the needs of the people, anchored on people's needs within the citizen life cycle. So I like that concept, the citizen life cycle. So from birth to burial, no? it's similar to the social welfare states in, uh, in Scandinavia. And, and finally, we have to uh, deal with outcome-based government agencies. So we don't just create agencies or government uh, bodies. We create on the basis of the outcomes that they are supposed to be uh, geared towards. And uh, I like the strategic cycle, the, the outcome-based budget strategic cycle which includes the total cycle from planning for outcome to budgeting for outcome to monitoring and evaluation to re results reporting. In a way, this kind of uh, outcome-based cycle can be a great antidote against corruption because you're actually looking at planning towards performance. And uh, take note of that slide presented by Dr. Bendia on the civil servants. Ano ba ang katangi ang mga civil servants? No? They, they need to be creative and constructive, imaginative and innovative, proactive and polite, professional and progressive, energetic and enabling, transparent and tech-enabled. So mukhang magbabago ang ano natin no ang outcome based education kung ganyan ang requirements ngayon ng civil service. Anticipatory governance will be using the future to create multicultural learning and to foster intelligent and inspired organizations. So I would like to end with that it's uh, that uh, presentation on anticipatory governance I think should provide the path for, for this new administration. Veer away from the so-called legacy of the Marcos Senior Administration and move towards the future. So thank you to all our speakers. And I, I certainly learned a lot from, from your presentations. Thank you. Thank you for your insights and your action to the topics addressed uh, in this forum, Dr. Uh, Magno. People. And actually, it's all encompassing. Um, I'm, I'm afraid uh, we don't have enough time for our participants to um, give their comments or questions. But uh, to take the opportunity, to take advantage of this opportunity and considering that they also came from a youth leadership program, I would like to ask uh, perhaps our panel, the three, the three esteemed speakers, um, a question about what areas of engagement can the youth, um, because uh, as director, uh, as Dr. Magno shared, uh, mukhang mag-iiba na yung ating uh, civil servants uh, requirement uh, based on Dr. Bandia Sherry. So may, may I ask our esteemed guests, uh, what areas of engagement can the youth comprising more than half of our population uh, to participate in order to help advance holistic and inclusive governance? Perhaps, uh, yeah, Professor Padilla or Dr. Yeah, Sir Santiago or Professor Manhit can answer. Um, Professor Manhit, you're on mute. Po. Uh, Professor Manhit, Prof. Pindo, you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I said that. I hope I can share my views uh, before I turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, the, the youth, given uh, our demographic uh, 
nature of Philippine society can clearly play a, a critical role in shaping our future. But the youth as a whole needs to define themselves where to engage also. At a younger level, maybe they can engage by really demanding from government to be more responsive in terms of addressing their concerns. And when you look at the data I shared, critical really is livelihood jobs. So for government to provide for them a more investment-led growth, not consumption-based alone. But as they grow older, I think they should see themselves as really partners of government, be it while in the private sector, in their own profession, in their own businesses, and also looking at themselves as possibly partners in, in helping address challenges of uh, Philippine development as uh, maybe members of civil society. So how do we see ourselves that maybe it's time for us to be citizens, not only in legal term, but really citizens to be active part of government, but government for its part, not to be more open. Democracy is having about open society, open systems, and government needs to create that environment that there's transparency, openness, and accountability in government for the youth to engage and for the youth to, to truly become part of uh, this inclusive governance. Thank you, Prof. Tindo. How about uh, Sir Santiago or Dr. Vincia? Your thoughts? Well, well for, my, for my part, I, I agree with uh, what Tindo mentioned. Uh, that is very basic. And one thing basic that I also uh, advocate for is the youth's involvement in understanding, like what Dr. Magno said. Uh, I made the thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, I used those thumbs up, thumbs down icons to make it easy for, for the youth to understand. Uh, it's a beginning uh, that would make them interested in the workings of government, what good governance is all about. It has to start with awareness and understanding. So that has been my advocacy for, you know, for, for the youth to start being interested. Uh, I, I tell my students, you cannot claim that you are not interested in politics much less be proud that you are not interested in politics. They have to be interested. If the, if the, gov if the, if the country has any chance at all in achieving good governance, there must be interest from the youth. Thank you, Sir Santiago. Uh, that's a yeah, very interesting and uh, thought-provoking reminder for young people like us. Dr. Vendia. Uh. I've always advocated that the youth should have a deep sense of nationalism because the problem is if you don't have a, that kind of identity or you, you, there is no identification of oneself to the nation, it becomes a very difficult thing to really uh, help the country and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and address the problems of, uh, of the nation. So I. Uh, I've always advocated, even if I am outside of the country right now, uh, the youth the, or the uh, Filipinos who were uh, born from Filipino uh, parents and but has grown overseas should not abandon their their culture and must be integrated into the future uh, of the country. Now, uh, I've always mentioned that the youth is the future of our motherland. So there must be a great identification and deep sense of nationalism, because if you love your nation, you love your government, you will have to be uh, promoting the interests of the nation of the, the and, and, and of the government, the commitment to, to, 
to address the long-term problems as well, long-term challenges that the government uh, and the nation faces. But it's not only a sense of nationalism, they must be global in the sense that they must be able to uh, enhance their skills and enhance their capabilities uh, to, uh, uh, to answer the needs of the future. The technological uh, challenges have to be addressed by, by Filipinos themselves. I think the DOST has this Balik Bayan or Balik Scientists uh, program uh, whereby uh, scientists overseas uh, to be able to address the issue of brain drain is to encourage uh, uh, Filipino scientists to return in the Philippines and help in, 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 nation, in nation building. So I think that's a, that's a very good program. And, uh, and uh, it has, uh, or the scientists aside from being global in perspective must be able to, uh, uh, to, to help uh, the nation address its uh, multifaceted and multidimensional challenges. And only by having a, that kind of uh, oneness, deep sense of nationalism, technical capability, to address uh, uh, issues and problems of the future, we will be able to come up with a government that would be stronger and, uh, and, uh, and address the fundamental problems of our people. Thank you, Dr. Bendia, and thank you also, uh, Prof. Indo, Sir Santiago, um, for this very interesting and insightful discussion. And, um, we're also raising critical points, of course, in the review of the events of the former uh, Duterte administration and its implication in the current uh, President Marcos's junior's term. So, in as much as we want to entertain other uh, comments or inquiries or perhaps questions from our participants, I'm afraid we don't have enough time. So, I will now uh, turn over the floor to Professor Menhit for his closing remarks for the spiritual town hall. Thank you, Attorney Dredd, Ople. Thank you to our speakers, Dr. Rolly, Wendia, Professor Edwin, Santiago, commentaries and reaction of Dr. Kiko. Friends and partners from way, way back in terms of fighting for governance and the upliftment of the Filipino people and nation. Allow me to share final thoughts that I'd like to for our participants to hear perspective from, from the ADR Institute. But when you look at Philippine governance, learning from six years of the Duterte administration and looking forward with the Marcos administration, what I'd like to share is the concept of inclusive governance in my mind. We have seen that issues that matter to Filipinos and what the government must address today. Learning from history and looking back is necessary to build better and move forward, especially from the various crises we face the past two and a half years. I even emphasize what I've said the past two years, the economic consequences of this long emergency, health emergency. This is what we have done today through this forum. We must not forget the shortcomings of the previous administration, but we must also recognize what it has done well. We use not just domestic standards, but international governance indicators, as shared by Professor Edwin. Beyond this, we learn that the government must look not just at outputs, but more importantly, outcomes. Being outcome-oriented fosters longer-term thinking and helps create a more effective form of governance. Moreover, we saw how governance needs political champions at every level and beyond sectors, not only government, business, and civil society, but collectively. As such, we at the Strat-based ADR Institute 
and the Democracy Watch Philippines primarily call on government to move forward an agenda of good, inclusive governance, holistic governance, as Dr. Buendia spoke about it earlier. We also call on the Marcus Jr. administration to follow through with its policy pronouncements, priorities, and promises. We fervently hope that government officials will remain attentive to the public needs, concerns, and demands for the Filipino people. We further call on stakeholders, not simply to criticize, to react, but to actively engage the Marcos Jr. administration. As we call on groups from civil society, the private sector, concerned individuals to hold our leaders accountable, to pursue the reforms and programs it said it would. For our democracy to progress, we must continue engaging with the government, partnering when and where possible for various efforts. A whole of society approach is what we need to address the societal challenges we're facing today. We, the Strat Base Institute and Democracy Watch remain cautiously optimistic, especially now during the budget season for 2023, as the different priorities receive their respective budget allocations, all in line with President Marcos Jr. eight point social economic agenda. We look forward to what the coming year will look like under a Marcos Jr. leadership. And from there, we too will assess how his term is unfolding because we believe that all government must be evaluated objectively across widely accepted governance standards. For this is how we help our country to become better. Again, thank you for all those who participated. Thank you for our speakers. Thank you to our moderator, Tony Dred Opler. And let us learn from these exchanges and let's move forward to push and ensure a more inclusive, holistic governance in Philippine society. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Prof. Dindo. That concludes our virtual town hall discussion for today. And that's entitled Philippine Governance Lessons and Prospects for the Marcos Jr. Administration. Stay safe, everyone, from the time. Have a great Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.